Okay, hello everybody. Thank you very much for coming. I'm so delighted to be here. I know it's getting towards the end of a really packed conference, so everybody's a bit tired, but I'll try and keep it interesting. Keep everyone awake. Are you awake? Hello? Yay, good. I want to talk about Apache Samza, an open source project uh, which I work on for uh, distributed stream processing, processing high volume data streams. Um, just very quickly about myself so that you know who is this idiot talking to you here. Um, my name is Martin Kleppmann. I am currently working at LinkedIn, and LinkedIn is sponsoring uh, this development on Samsa. Um, before that, I co founded two startups, so I've seen things from the, the small company side as well. Um, the second, which was called Reportive, it was acquired by LinkedIn a couple of years ago, and still working at LinkedIn now. I'm also uh, a bit active in Apache, working on Avro and Samsa now. Uh, also trying to write a book on data-intensive applications for O'Reilly, so that's a whole lot of stuff. Anyway, you can find me online as well. Um, I primarily want to talk about Samsa, but I can't really talk about Samsa without talking about Kafka. These are two separate projects, um, but both have come out of LinkedIn, both share kind of the same underlying mindset. And although they do different things, Samsa is a stream processing project, uh, Kafka is a kind of a message broker, so it's the thing that transports any messages from A to B. Um, they, you can use each individually, separately, they don't have a strict dependency on each other, but they do, do, they do go together really well. I kind of think of it like, you know, they're like beer and curry bus. You can have each taken by itself, and it's okay by itself, but take the two together, and it's really perfect. So, a bit for background, what kind of things are we actually trying to do with uh, these projects? Um, one example might be if you have a website with some kind of newsfeed-like features. You want you know, various people posting updates, or maybe liking things, or commenting on things, or changing their job title, or whatever it be. Um, a lot of stuff happening, and you want to make sure that that information is shown to the right people, to people who will find it interesting, who will likely find it valuable, engage with it. Um, it needs to be reasonably timely, so you don't want to have to wait for hours from posting an update until people can see it. There might be complicated business logic associated with this, like privacy settings. Uh, so this is one example of the kind of things we want to do. Another, which is a bit more internal to systems, would be something like updating a search index. So um, if you think about LinkedIn, it's kind of like one massive search index, really. So you add a keyword to your profile, and then you go to the search box, and you search for that keyword to see if you appear in the search results. So that means we need pretty near real-time indexing of any updates of data that happens here uh, so that you can find yourself again. It doesn't have to be totally instantaneous, but within a couple of seconds is usually what we aim for there. Even more internally to the system, you know, we aggregate a lot of logs, metrics, uh, internal data about which service is calling which other data. That's a huge volume of stuff. It's really valuable to be able to analyze that, do things like if suddenly there's a spike of exceptions, be able to quickly react to that. So again, uh, latency is fairly critical there. Uh, within a couple of seconds or minutes, we want to be able to respond to things. Now, if you think about sort of data processing systems in general, there's kind of this spectrum. On the one extreme, you've got synchronous, tightly coupled services where every time something happens, you make, say, a REST call or an RPC call or whatever it be to some other service. Uh, and that, that obviously communicates the information immediately to that other service which is fine for a lot of things, but the more of these calls you add, the more you tightly couple all of these services, and the whole thing can become a bit of a nightmare. Um, if there's any individual part of the system that slows down, the entire thing slows down. So it's really problematic. On the other extreme, you've got systems like Hadoop, MapReduce, and all of the additional kind of uh, data analysis tools that are coming out, which uh, work in a sort of batch processing fashion, right, where you accumulate a whole bunch of data of some kind of fixed size, and then you run some kind of query or analysis on it, and then sometime minutes, hours, maybe even days later, you get some results. So uh, that's quite nice because you can decouple applications. You can have a data set in HDFS once, 
and all sorts of different analyses can be run on that. But uh, on the downside, there's a lot of latency. So where SAMHSA fits in is kind of in between these two. So it's not synchronous, it's for processing that happens asynchronously. You still want that nice decoupling that you would get from data pipelines in something like Hadoop, uh, but you don't want to wait as long. And the model of communication will be very familiar to many of you. You know, you've got a bunch of users making requests to services. Those uh, requests are served, but as a side effect, various events get emitted. And at LinkedIn, we use Kafka heavily for this. Um, and then these events can then in turn be consumed for all sorts of different purposes. It might be for purposes of analytics, both to show to users or internal analytics. You might be updating caches or maintaining indexes. You might be sending out push notifications, email notifications, all sorts of things can happen. Uh, so this is a kind of pu uh, published subscribe communication model, right? And uh, the types of events we can deal with is, it's a very broad spectrum. You can think of anything. You can think of tracking events, which would be click stream type things. So a user clicked on a particular item at a particular time uh, within a particular session. Uh, you can even think of database changes. You know, whenever you make a write to a database, you can think of that also as an event. Something happened, namely, for primary key x, some value changed from y to z. Uh, you can think of any logs you have, even system level metrics. All of this is kind of events that we can, be, that we can process. Uh, and indeed at LinkedIn, all of these things do go through Kafka. Um, just to scope the problem a bit, so that the style of system that, this is, that we're designing here, uh, we're thinking of many independent consumers which might be run by different teams across a big company. Um, we want the system to have very high throughput of millions of messages per second. Uh, we want reasonably low latency, uh, usually sub one second is uh, roughly, often it's like single digit milliseconds, but we're not aiming for you know, microsecond type things. That's out of scope. Just to give a bit of an idea of the kind of scale we're talking about here, here are a couple of big numbers from LinkedIn's production system as of a week or two ago. Um, we use Kafka very heavily for these kind of things. We pump hundreds of billions of messages per day through the system. Um, at peak, it's uh, latest I saw was 4.4 million messages per second. Um, each message is, you can probably work that out, I think just under 100 bytes on average or so. Um, so that adds up to quite a bit of network bandwidth, actually. This is distributed across uh, hundreds of machines, uh, across multiple data centers. Um, all of that is just kind of to give a context of what sort of scale we're dealing with. So now to SAMHSA. SAMHSA is a framework that allows you to take all of these message streams and process them, and to make that processing as simple as possible while still giving you really powerful tools to work with. But the base level API is actually very simple. It, it looks somewhat like a mapper in the MapReduce programming model. So at the moment, there's this Java API. Um, SAMHSA itself is actually implemented in Scala. You can use whatever JVM language you fancy. Um, interface is very simple. There's one method, which is called process, and that's called every time a message comes in. And that's it, really. So every message consists of a key and a value. Uh, the key is useful for partitioning, which I can explain later. Um, the message collector allows you to send messages out again. So the mes you get one message in, zero or more messages can be output as a result of this process call. And the coordinator lets you do kind of cluster level uh, management stuff. So if you want to implement a data processing or analysis pipeline with this, it's useful to take a step back and just as a reference point, think about what we do on the batch processing side first. Okay, so with MapReduce or with the higher level languages like Pig, Cascading, etc., similar things apply to Spark, uh, to uh, any, any of these um, many tools that we've heard about actually these days. Uh, there are a couple of kind of base level operations they do. So number one is filtering records. You know, either something matches a condition or not. That's clear. Mapping, which is just taking one and producing some transformed version of the, uh, of the record. Again, one record at a time. Next, now it's starting to get more interesting. You might want to join multiple data sets together. So take a key 
of a record from one data set, key from record in the other data set, and match those up where the key is equal, or some function of the key. Very similar to join is grouping, that would be finding all of the items with the same key in one data set. Um, then once you've grouped, of course, you can aggregate, as you know, sum, count, average, whatever you like. And crucially, you can take the output of one job and feed it in to the input of the next job. So in MapReduce, uh, you know, you would write the output to HDFS, to some directory, and then you can start a new job, or somebody else can start a new job, which reads that directory and uses that as its input. And like that, you can build these nice pipelines. So we really like that way of operating. So can we do the same thing for streams? With streams, you know, there's no beginning, there's no end. There's just constantly data coming in, and we need to deal with it as it happens. So if we take each of these operations we want to do and adapt it to streams, well, filtering, it's easy, OK? You know, you take one record in, either you pass it on or you throw it away. No problem. Again, map operation, again, very simple. You take in one record, do a bit of processing on it locally, and then pass the modified version on. Again, no problem at all. Join is where it gets more interesting. So you have two streams coming in, each of which has some key inside the record. Now, you know, what, what are you actually joining? You have one event which key, with key X on one stream comes in, and then at some point later, you don't know when, another event with the same key X may come in on the other stream. Somehow, we want to match that up. We'll talk about that in a minute. Grouping, again, as I said, is actually a very similar operation to joining, except that you're just doing the same thing on one stream. You're going to have to somehow remember the messages because you don't know when the next message is going to come up. Aggregation, well, once you've got the join or the, the grouping, aggregation is kind of doable. Um, but you do, there's this kind of tricky question about when do you know when you're done? You know, if you want to aggregate all of the events from one user session, for example, you don't know when the user closed their browser. You know, you kind of wait and then probably after some time out, you say. Maybe in some cases there's some kind of end event that you can pick up, but not in general. So, uh, oh yes, the final of these points, um, the output of one job becoming the input of the next job. Again, we want to use that because it lets us build these really scalable, composable data pipelines. But we do need to think quite carefully what happens in the case of faults. So if a machine dies, if somebody deploys a bad version of the code, any number of bad things can happen. We just want to maintain sanity in that as well. So what I want to focus on right now is the stateful parts of stream processing. As I said, the kind of basic filtering mapping, that's easy. Um, but the joining, the grouping, the aggregation, that's what's hard. So let's work with an example that makes it a bit easier to understand. Uh, say you have a website which has ads on it, and you want to know the click-through rate for your ads. So you've got events coming in saying, oh, I had an ad impression, i.e. somebody loaded a page with an ad on it. And on the other side, you've got ad clicks, which is every time somebody clicked on an ad. So if you want to know the click-through rate, you need both of those numbers. You need to know how many times the ad was shown and which of those times it was clicked on. So the, a join here needs to happen. But if you think about it, there's a problem here. So firstly, I might load a website, load a page with an ad on it, then go off for lunch, then an hour later come back to my machine, and the website is still there, and I see the ad and click on it. So now there might be an hour delay, or even more delay, between the impression event and the click event. Do you still want to join that? You know, there probably needs to be some kind of maximum window of time over which you're willing to join. Otherwise, you would just end up waiting forever. The opposite can happen as well. It could happen that you receive the click event before you receive the impression event. If the impression of a queue is backlogged a bit, well, you know, there'll, there'll be some delay in the processing there. So you can get out of order delivery. That also makes it interesting. Um, so for stream processing, we call this a window join where you say, OK, there's some window of time, which may be a minute or an hour or whatever you, is appropriate for you over which you're willing to make that join. But if you want to do that, you have to actually buffer 
the events for that period of time. You have to remember that I saw an impression event for some impression ID, some unique ID, up to an hour ago. And then when the click event comes in, you can see, ah, I remembered earlier that this event was here, so now I can join it. So you require state. You have to remember for each key that you want to join on what were the messages on the other stream that you saw. And for that, you need some kind of key value store. So how do we implement this? In the simplest case, you know you could just keep it in memory if it's a small amount of data. But let's assume you want a larger window of time so you can't actually fit the data in memory. So, well, one option is you actually put all of that in an external database. So you choose Cassandra or HBase or MongoDB or React, whatever takes your fancy. Every time a message comes in, you, all, you then go and store it in this key value store. And then every time a message comes in on the other stream, you take that, take the key, check, do I have something to join with in my store? And if so, ah, yes, join it and emit the result. If not, oh, OK. Or maybe you have to store it in order to handle the ordering. The problem with using this kind of key value store is that things can get rather slow. So Samza is uh, optimized for processing for high throughput. Uh, and we can actually get like hundreds of thousands of messages per node uh, through SAMHSA. Um, however, if you're talking over the network for every single message, you know, the QPS you can get out of a database will vary, of course, a lot by database, what kind of hardware you run it on. But it can easily be orders of magnitude lower than the throughput. So if you do it this way, you really risk dropping your throughput of your stream processor massively. We don't want to do that. So, alternative. This is where SAMHSA is different from some of the other stream processing frameworks you might have seen, like Storm. What we do is actually, every stream processor has with it a little key value store, which is right there on the same machine. In fact, it's in the same process. At the moment, we're using level DB for that, although actually we're having a few performance problems. So we're looking into rocks DB, at a, as an, which is Facebook's fork of level DB, but the idea is very much the same. Um, because this is in process, we can read and write to the thing super fast, which is absolutely wonderful. There's a problem with it, which you might be thinking of already, but I will come to that in a minute. First, let me give another example to just make clear just quite how useful this kind of stateful stream processing is. Say you wanted to implement Twitter. Um, in Twitter, in the, the simplest kind of possible incarnation, you've got two types of events that can happen. One is a follow or unfollow event, which, is hap which happens every time some kind of follow status changes. And the other is somebody tweeted something. And so this is quite interesting now because you can take these follow events and build up the social graph, the follower graph, and you can take the tweet events and every time someone tweets something, you know the list of all of their followers. So you write that message out to each of their followers, and they can then get notified, or it can be streamed to their mobile app, or WebSocket to their browser, or whatever it be, right? So how do we implement something like this? You have two input streams, which we want to join. And we need to maintain, again, some kind of state. So say you have two messages coming in. First, the follow event. So first, the event saying user 138 is now following user 582. And you take that and you record it in your key value store. So you do something like uh, have a mapping, say, from user 582 to the list of all of their followers. And that list now includes 138, because we said 138 is now following 582. And now user 582 tweets something. They say, I'm at Berlin Buzzwords and it rocks. And so all of the followers need to be, that, that message now needs to be delivered to all of those followers of user 582. So our stream processor looks in our key value store, sees that list of followers, and for each of the followers, writes out a new message saying, notify this user, in this case 138, there's a new tweet waiting for them. 
So the result is then some kind of inbox for each user, or timeline, as Twitter calls it. And once you've got that, you can then uh, chain further things off it. So you could have a job which sends out push notifications or streams to a browser or whatever it be, right? So this idea of keeping the state uh, is a very powerful one because it allows you to do these kind of joins. And what SAMHSA tries to do here is to move the computation and the data into the same place. It's maybe a bit comparable to the, you know, the placement of mappers in, in MapReduce, where you try to put the mapper local, uh, with locality to the data on HDFS. Here, it's kind of the other way around. We've started up our process on a machine, and we make sure that the state stays there with the process. However, there's a big problem with this, and that is, how do we make this whole thing fault tolerant? Now, for that, I need to explain a bit about the architecture of SAMHSA how it actually works internally. So you might actually find this quite interesting. Um, on the basis, you have multiple machines. And on each machine, probably the first thing you will deploy is Kafka. So Kafka acts as the message transport mechanism here. Kafka is itself replicated. So every item of data, every message you write to Kafka will be copied onto however machines you configure, say three machines. Um, so even if one of those machines go away, you know that the data won't be lost. So that's the first thing you install. The second thing you install is Yarn. So Samza actually runs on top of Yarn. If you have an existing Hadoop 2 cluster, then you can just run it on there, and it should work absolutely fine. Um, there have been various talks about Yarn already, so I won't go into too much detail of how it works. But the general idea is that each uh, machine has a node manager running on it, which is in charge of all of the processes running on that machine. And these processes in YARN terminology are called containers. And SAMHSA provides a YARN container, and your code, your processing code, is loaded into those containers and started up. So within each of those containers, you've got a task instance, which is running your code. And each of these task instances has this little embedded key value store that I was talking about. Now, now, what happens if an entire machine goes boom, and all of this is lost? So now, OK, throw away that machine. We've got another machine over here on the cluster. It's already got Kafka installed on it. So at least Kafka we don't need to worry about. That will have already been part of the replication. But at the moment, there's just an empty YARN node manager sitting there. Jan will notice that, oh, we've lost some containers. I guess we should start those up again. So it goes and starts up some SAMHSA containers again. SAMHSA goes, ah, here we've got some empty containers. Which tasks should they be running? And those tasks which were previously running on the failed machine are now restarted in the containers on this new machine. So far, so good. But these little key value stores that are attached to each of these stream processing tasks are now empty because we didn't replicate that data. You know, that th those key value stores, they're just on the local file system of each machine. And that is sadness because we don't like losing data. So how do we make sure that we don't lose data? And this is one of the points where I think SAMHSA is really cool, actually. And I can say that it's really cool because I didn't invent it. So I'm not taking any, any credit for this at all. Um, the idea is, every time you write to this local key value store that's embedded in your process, you also write to Kafka. As I said, Kafka is replicated and durable. Whenever you write something to Kafka, you can be sure that it won't be lost. It has a key value model. You can't look up things by key, so it doesn't provide a key value interface. All you can do is append to the log. But it can do that very, very fast. It can append to the log incredibly quickly with millions of messages per second, as I was saying. So what we're effectively doing here is building our own database replication log, kind of you know, a bit like a write-ahead log that you would get in a relational database. Every time you write to your key value store, you also write to the stream of things. And most of the time, 
Nobody's reading from it, but that's totally fine. Kafka just sits there. Kafka has a few optimizations for exactly this kind of thing. So if you write the same key over and over and over again, that can get compacted in the background. So that stops this log from growing unbounded, and it means that the restore time is then bounded as well. Um, and that's a nice new feature in Kafka 081, if you haven't seen it yet. Anyway, with all of those writes replicated to Kafka, we can now go back to this. Uh, Samza starts up, OK, we've got these key value stores, but they're empty. So let's just consume that replication topic. All of those data, all of those messages, those change messages, every time we wrote to the key value store, are still there. We can just suck all of that in, apply them in order, and once we've done that, we've restored those key value stores to their former glory. They now contain just what they did beforehand, and we are happy. So that's quite nice. Uh, just to recap, so the idea here is we replicate all of the writes to Kafka, um, we can restore from that, and compaction built into Kafka means that we don't end up using all the disk space in the world. So I was talking about fault tolerance. There's another aspect of fault tolerance that's not as often talked about as machines blowing up, but it's actually at least as important. And that is things go slow. And when things go slow, you know, it's still kind of working, but actually everything falls apart. And it's the hardest thing to debug because, you know, sometimes just one thing going slow can cause another thing to go slow, and suddenly everything is going slow, and you run out of threads, and everything is bad. So we don't want that to happen. In a stream processing environment, as I said, we want to be able to chain jobs together. And they might be, um, might be consuming multiple inputs, maybe producing multiple outputs. The output of one job could be consumed by multiple different jobs, and you want to be able to compose these things very freely without any constraints. In particular, you might want different jobs to be maintained by different teams within your company. Because actually, you know, this output of one job, it's a very nice interface. I can, you know, Team X can just say, OK, we have these jobs two and three, and you can consume our outputs, and there'll be a certain SLA to, you know, the reliability or the speed at which data goes through there. And so Team Y and Team Z can rely on that, build their own jobs which, which consume that data. Team X doesn't need to worry about the fact that it has these consumers. You know, Team X just provides the data. Anyone can read it. Now, what happens if this job here maintained by Team Y goes slow and the turtle is sticking its arms and the leg and looking really sad. In this case, well, there are a couple of options. Option one is you can drop data. So you can say, OK, sorry, you weren't fast enough to pick up the data. It's gone now. Sorry. But we don't really like that. I don't like losing data. The second option is back pressure. And this is very commonly applied. So Storm, for example, again, uses this model, which is, well, OK, if you're not consuming fast enough, let's just wait and give you some time to catch up. And then when you're ready to consume some more data, we'll give you some more data. The problem with back pressure is that now the producer of this data has to wait for the consumer of this data. And when the producer of the data is waiting, all other consumers of the same data also have to wait. And all producers who are feeding into that producer also have to wait. And suddenly everything is waiting for everything just because of one stupid slow job. So we don't want that either, OK? The end, that would cause the entire system to grind to a halt. So the only option we have here is to queue up the data. So if somebody's slow to consume it, we'll just store it somewhere so that when they come back and they start processing fast again, that they can get the data that they missed in the interim. Now, if you're queuing, again, there are two options. Either you can queue up in memory, and then if you have high volume streams, you will run out of memory eventually. And then again, we have sadness. So that leaves actually only one remaining option, which is you have to spill this data to disk, which kind of sounds like you know, the best of a bad bunch. But actually, Kafka writes everything to disk anyway. Every single message you write to Kafka 
is already written to disk, and it is specialized in making this disk-based architecture work really well. So actually what we do with SAMHSA is simply every single job always writes its output streams to Kafka. This is really nice because anyone can then just consume those and Kafka acts as the buffer, the queue, in between those jobs. And it decouples the jobs from, another, from one another. And Kafka can keep like days or even weeks worth of buffer because disks are cheap and uh, you can use SSDs or you can use spinning hard drives. It does all sequential I.O. So it actually works remarkably well. Samza always writes its job output to Kafka, which kind of by analogy you can think of as MapReduce every single processing stage materializes its output to HDFS, which I realize is kind of out of fashion these days with things like Spark, which try to not materialize to disk. Um, so I guess this can, can just be a, a counterpoint to that, not saying that they're wrong, um, just saying that actually there are advantages if you write to disk because you can then give the stream a name. You can tell anyone that they can consume it. There's no buffering, no back, pre uh, no back pressure, no dropping of data required. Um, it's durable, which means that even when things go away, when machines go away, you can still be available. If you want to debug your system and figure out why you're getting bad data, you can just attach to one of them. You can just look at it. It's really beautiful, actually. And it's a very clean interface between jobs. So, to recap, what I talked about were a few things in SAMHSA and how we solve those problems. One problem we talked about was this buffering. One job's output becomes another job's input. Our solution is simple. We write it to Kafka. Kafka takes care of that buffering. The other problem I talked about beforehand, if you remember the key value store and the state and how do we make that fault tolerant even though it's on the same machine and just on one machine, we want it not to die, no, not to lose that state if the machine dies. The answer is also we write it to Kafka because Kafka replicates it to multiple machines and makes it durable. One final thing that I didn't talk about um, out of time, but um, which is also quite interesting to look at is actually the checkpointing. So if, you need, if a, some job dies, either by hardware or software failure, and you need to bring it back up again, how do you know where it should start? Well, you need some kind of checkpoints. You could write those checkpoints to Zookeeper, but we found that Zookeeper can easily become a bottleneck if you're writing to it too much. Actually, we've got a system that we can write to really well, which handles really, writes really well. Guess what? We can write it to Kafka, and that's why there's this great relationship between Samza and Kafka, okay? So I do encourage you to give it a try. Uh, it's all open source. Kafka is a top-level Apache project. Samza is in the incubator at the moment and uh, definitely looking for contributors as well. Um, I suggest the first thing to take a look at is actually Hello Samza, which is a, a, just a little script which installs a local cluster for you. It downloads Yarn, it downloads Zookeeper, and it downloads Kafka, starts those three up, and then runs a job which consumes a live feed of edits on Wikipedia. So every time someone edits a page on Wikipedia, did you know they actually published this to an IRC channel? And we can consume that IRC channel as an input here and then write some SAMHSA jobs which do some analytics on that. And you can just run it in five minutes. It's, it's really neat. So here's some links for you to get started. There's a nice blog post by Jay Kreps, the second point here, um, one of my colleagues at LinkedIn, who kind of has set out the underlying thinking behind uh, SAMHSA and this mode of stream processing. Um, and there's me on Twitter and my blog as well, if you fancy. So hopefully we have a little bit of time for questions as well. Uh, a while ago I had uh, someone told me that SAMHSA is still quite new and quite immature. What's the current state? How production ready is it? When will you expect production readiness? Um, it's rapidly maturing, I should say. So it's still a new project, that's absolutely true. Uh, LinkedIn is running it in production, though. Um, so we've currently got, I think, two production jobs and working very actively right now to move more into production. Um, as that happens, of course, we discover issues and we're ironing them out. Um, so it's, LinkedIn is betting very heavily on this, actually. Um, so important jobs are being put on it. So 
uh, if it's not totally mature yet, then it will be pretty soon. If you compare it uh, to older things like uh, RabbitMQ, ActiveMQ, all these uh, terrible commercial ESB buses all around, could you replace it? Or could you imagine that it would be able to replace it in, in production with the same reliability? So, um, well, RabbitMQ, ActiveMQ, they are more like message brokers. So they don't give you a, a framework for actually processing the data. That would depend on some libraries. Um, so SAMSA focuses on the processing side, um, Kafka on the message broker side. So you could definitely have a SAMSA job that consumes from something like RabbitMQ or ActiveMQ. Use that as an input. That's totally fine. Um, some of the fault tolerance things in SAMSA rely on semantics of Kafka. If you can implement those same semantics with a different queuing, with a different broker, you can get the same end result. Um, but it, with some it's easier, with some it's harder. Um, we, we are, we're pushing most of our data through Kafka rather than one of the other message queues, mainly for scale reasons. So uh, Kafka can just handle vastly bigger throughput um, at reasonably low cost for the, for the kind of message throughput we need. And the, the semantics are actually very nice as well. <coughs> Hi. Um, I, I, I I came across an interesting solution to the slowness problem, which may or may Sorry, not work problem? into the slowness problem, mm -hmm. the slowness fault tolerance, uh, where they um, they applied back pressure, which then caused the um, the sender to start aggregating. Now that that's an interest, it becomes an interesting data uh, data structure problem, but um, it seemed to work for them pretty well, and it seems like something that Samza could actually implement, as opposed to something like for, you know Kafka or, or RabbitMQ. Potentially, yes. So at the moment, we've deliberately made the framework really simple um, and made sure that those foundations are really reliable. So actually focusing a lot more on the operational side than on the, the cool researchy ideas that we have for the future right now. Um, but there are loads of potential extensions we could make to the framework. That's a good one to keep in mind, yes. Uh, how do you compare SAMSA, for example, to Esper with uh, facilitating window joins? Like Esper has its own query language and can do whatever window joins with in two hours or something. Mm. Do I have to do it myself in SAMSA or is there...? Yeah, so SAMSA provides a very low-level interface at the moment, just that Java API that you saw. And similarly, you could have a Java API for reading and writing to the, your key so value store. Win window joins, I just have to do myself and using at, this key value store. Yes. At the moment, those kind of high-level operations you have to build yourself. We have been thinking a lot about what a good stream processing language, a higher-level language, would look like, which then compiles down to these kind of things. We haven't rushed into building one yet because we want to make sure that we really understand the problem domain well. Um, but this is an invitation to all of you if you think you have good ideas for what a high-level stream processing language would look like, by all means, please implement them, share your ideas. The, the more ideas we get in this space, the better. So something like Esper would probably be a good starting point. I don't know how well it would work with the distributed nature of SAMSA, but I'm not an expert in Esper. So it seems that uh, the philosophy for your, your architecture is like write everything uh, in Kafka, which is like a really fast uh, thing. So why do you also need another local database to store your data for aggregates and not just write everything in Kafka and read it from there? Uh, Kafka has deliberately the simplest possible data structure that could work. Um, so the philosophy there is all you can do really is append to file. Well, there are two operations. One is append to file. That's the only write you can do. And the only read you can do is take a file offset somewhere in this linear sequence and start reading from there. So it doesn't provide key value access at all. The only thing you can do is sequentially read messages in the order that they were published. Um, and because it has this really simple model, it can do that really, really well. But then if you want arbitrary random access to it, you then kind of need to index this. Um, so you can kind of think of it like a heap file versus an index in a, in a relational database. Um, and the index is not provided by Kafka, so that's something you can then build with SAMSA. 
Uh, one question from my side, please. Um, crucial, a crucial feature is uh, this uh, time window based storage. Uh, where is it implemented? Sorry, the crucial feature so, is what? Is, is this um, time window, the, the, the lifetime of the events in the stream, a time window, have mm -hmm. a time, time window based lime, lifetime, where this feature is implemented? So at the moment, there's no built-in implementation of window joins. Uh, we give you just these low-level APIs of receive message, publish message, read from key value store, write to key value store. Okay. Um, and you can do range queries and a few things like that. So that, again, is deliberate, just wanting to make sure that we understand what the API should look like really well before rushing into building something. Um, so at the moment, each job would have to build the window join implementation itself. Um, but it means you can have any kind of implementation you want. And then we reckon that you know, maybe in six months' time or a year's time, we will have seen, OK, from our experience of seeing these 15 different production jobs, this implementation works really well. Now we can take that out and put it in the framework. Um, but yes, it's deliberately focusing on simplicity right now. Thank you. OK. I think, uh, okay. Are we done then? You can always still find me later. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>